Good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's meeting, which is entitled The Economics of Capitalism. Now, tonight, we've got a presentation from Dr. Rangjit Bra, who will be joining us now. Uh, Rangjit, I'm going to ask you to unmute and over to you. Thanks very much, Rob. I'm hoping uh, that you can all see me now. It's a pleasure to be with you. George uh, can't be with us today. We have instructed him to take a little bit of time off. As you know, he's imminently expecting the arrival uh, of his next child, and we send our love and best wishes out to George and Gatry. I hope you're watching along with us. Um, but we hope to use our time well in the meantime. Um, and the meeting has been adv advertised as the economics of capitalism. And the economics of capitalism are of great interest for us to study because it's through understanding the economics of capitalism that we can understand really what is the essence also of socialism. Uh, I have prepared a little presentation and I'm hoping that if I do this, you can see it. Can everyone see that? Fantastic. So the economics of capitalism is also the basis of what I would like to think of as the science of socialism, which is really political economy, the study of politics and economics as they affect the production relations of modern society. And are you seeing the next slide there? Uh, and really these ideas have come about as a result of much of the history that we maybe are taught and are familiar with, but haven't looked upon perhaps in the right way to understand the way in which that has a bearing on our socialist politics. Britain was, of course, the first country to have uh, a, 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 an, a civil war where the bourgeoisie, where the capitalist class came to power. Oliver Cromwell uh, was clearly the leader uh, of uh, a rising of the parliamentarians against the old monarchical feudal system. And the English Civil War of 1642 to 1648 was the first time that the capitalist class grew in stature and power um, and was able to assert itself politically. Its slogan was no taxation without representation. Having become a dominant economic force in the country, it wanted also to become the dominant political force in the country. And it was characterized by the rise of a new kind of army, an army which was essentially egalitarian, one that was based on merit, and one which brought to the fore capable workers uh, and yeomen who wouldn't have had the ability to command positions of power within the old uh, feudal system. But this really, what was the symbolic significance of the English Civil War? It was the rise of the new merchant capitalist class, and it was a revolutionary struggle. If you look back, many of the lists that are available on, uh, on Wikipedia, on YouTube, on the internet, I will talk about lists of monarchs stretching from apparently time immemorial right down to the modern day of Queen Elizabeth. But there's a short period between 1649 and 1660, which is generally referred to as the interregnum. It's just as if one uh, 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 queen or king just went away for a little while before then popping up again. And this was an uninterrupted phase. But this was the English Revolution. This was the first time that there was a challenge uh, of the divine right of kings. And uh, you can see a pub there, uh, the King Charles's head. And this King Charles's head became symbolic because it was a real question for the revolutionaries, even once they'd taken power, the feudal class, was it possible even to cut off the head of a king? They assumed that God would come down and smote whoever tried to did it, but they found it was possible. Uh, but the question is what propelled these um, historical changes? And of course, Cromwell, when he looked at his actions, didn't consider himself as to be just simply the, the representative of merchant capital. He thought this was a just way to behave. And actually he considered himself the servant of God, God's Englishman, just as 
King Charles I would have considered himself the monarch by the divine right of kings. So we can no more judge a historical epoch by its own ideas than we judge a man by what he thinks of himself. So what is it that propelled society forward? What brought these tumultuous changes to our own country, our own country, which we're told has no history of revolution, has no history of socialism. But in fact, from that struggle, we saw the early movements of the oppressed workers of England, uh, the levelers uh, led by Lilburn um, and the diggers. And you can see, I hope there, uh, a little picture. Uh, that's actually St. George's Hill. Um, and that was in 1649, when uh, Gerald Wood Stanley, who was the leader of the diggers, led the common people to take back the common land. And they addressed themselves to the lords of the country from the poor and oppressed people of England. And they have said, you know, they wanted to ensure that the poor people had the right to work the land in common. And there is a very famous um, a folk song in 1649, St. George's Hill, a rugged band they called the diggers came to show the people's will. They defied the landlord, they defied the law, they were the dispossessed proclaiming what was theirs. And this was an early sense really of what socialism was. It was the assertion of the common people to their right to a living. Uh, when they were being degraded by poverty and want. That movement was crushed. It was, in a sense, ahead of its time. But on the back of the English uh, Civil War, on the back of the rise of the merchant class, came the Industrial Revolution, came a change in the whole way in which uh, production was organized, uh, with several very key revolu uh, uh, inventions which allowed a huge increase in the productivity of labor of the common people. And we were taught these things uh, at school. And yet, I, for one, certainly didn't appreciate their significance of the spinning jenny, of Arkwright's water frame, of the steam engine. What, what do these things really mean? They were, you know, field outings we used to go and see some of them. But we didn't appreciate the extent to which that this manufacture uh, this process led to a huge increase in the ability of mankind to produce as much and more than it needs actually to satisfy its own wants and that around that change in the means of production and on that change in the way we make the things that we need to eat and live there was a change in the whole nature and structure of society and in fact the birth and the rise of a new class the industrial working class. Last year, uh, we celebrated or we marked the 200th anniversary of the Peterloo massacre on the 16th of August, 1819. And this is not intended to be a comprehensive history of any of these struggles, but really using the fact that we all know about these things to illustrate some points that I want to make. There was a rise of a new class that the new class was this industrial working class, a class that didn't have a very clear and established place in society at that time, but was becoming increasingly important as manufacturing towns grew, as the number of people who worked in manufacture grew, and the people themselves felt themselves to be downtrodden, poor, oppressed, not to have a good standard of life. Their standard of life was constantly sinking despite the wealth that they were producing, and they were increasingly asking for the right to some representation, to some betterment and improvement in their circumstances. And they came together on St. Peter's Field and were attacked by the uh, magistrate and by the militias. Um, and there was a great massacre of the working people. And this really led to the beginning of the Chartist movement. And the Charter, when you look at it, is a very simple, and it certainly doesn't seem like a revolutionary document. They're really asking, workers were asking for a vote, for the vote to be secret, for constituencies to be equal, for payment of members of parliament, so that it wouldn't just be the landed gentry who were able to wield political power. And actually they asked for an annual parliament so that they could be regularly changed and there wouldn't be inherent corruption. But while that doesn't seem revolutionary at that time, political power was very clearly, uh, and by law and by convention, in the hands of a tiny elite. 
And if you look a little bit at the actual charter, uh, and it's worth just reading the Chartist appeal to the working men of London prior to the huge Kennington demonstration of 1848, a picture of which we just saw. And we'll just read it here. So the Chartist demonstration, peace and order is our motto. So we'll, we'll consider that as a tactic versus whether that's effective. But, but look at what they said to the working men of London, fellow men, the press having misrepresented and vilified us and our intentions, doesn't that sound familiar? The demonstration committee therefore consider it to be their duty to state that the grievances of us, the working classes are deep and our demands just. We and our families are pining in misery, want and starvation. We demand a fair day's wage for a fair day's work. A fair day's wage for a fair day's work. How old is that slogan? And yet this was just hinting really at the time at the extent to which they're exploited. They still hadn't understood the mechanism actually of their exploitation and impoverishment. So we, but they saw that they were the slaves of capital. They quite clearly saw that they were an oppressed class under the sway of the ruling class, but they demand protection of our labor. We are political serfs. We demand to be free. This is their feeling. It's an instinctual grasp of the fact that the working men were oppressed and exploited and they demanded better conditions of life. And it led to an understanding around this time as people were, were, were theorizing around the socialist movement of understanding what should be the aims and demands of the socialist movement that actually history, the whole of human history in fact, the whole of history of human civilization is in fact a history of class struggles. So we'll just read this little quote, under the veil of established customs, political intrigue, tricky laws and tangled teachings lies class struggle, the struggle of the propertied classes of all sorts with the propertyless masses, with the proletariat, which leads all the propertyless masses. So the concept of the working class, of the proletariat, of someone who is dispossessed of the things they need to harvest their labor themselves. So they have no means of production, they have no way of um, actually producing the things they need other than their ability to work, their own strength and the human and mental physical resources and divorce from any, any farms, any mills, any means of production for interesting historical process that we're going to speak about in lectures to come or our next few meetings, a short series of meetings. And I hope you'll join you that will whet your appetite and you'll return for that. Really, they had nothing to do but sell their labor power and it made them poor, but equally they were the basis of others' wealth. And this poverty arising uh, from their relations to the means of production, from their position as a class, is what made them dissatisfied and yearn for political change and been a key element in political change. And it was with the willingness to study what it was that was driving society forward and therefore what would should be the rational demands of how we can improve the society in which we live that socialism became a science that it became molded with the study of economics with the study of history uh, and with these really with the understanding of politics and that is really political economy and in the next few lectures we're going to or, or meetings we're going to talk a little bit about how society came to be capitalist we're going to talk about commodity production, understanding the way in which capitalist production and therefore capitalist exploitation work and function. So political economy in the widest sense is the science of the laws governing the production and exchange of the material means of subsistence in human society. And that theory arising from that understanding really is intended to be our guide to action of how we can successfully go about mobilizing people and putting demands which are achievable to improve our lot in society. It's interesting that it was the capitalist class themselves, the rising merchant class who wanted to understand their wealth, who wanted to understand how to um, really um, expand their colonies how to ensure that in their trading with other nations, they weren't impoverished and how to organize their business in an efficient way that they wanted to study the wealth of nations. They wanted to study economics, uh, but it was the capitalist class in their rising phase when they were doing away with uh, the, the monarchy, when they were, as we saw in, in the English 
revolution and afterwards when they were perfecting and pushing forward industry when they were trying to push to the to the background old ways which held uh, humanity back that they were able to really think about this in an unfettered uncluttered way and really since the wealth of nations published by adam smith the capitalist class haven't produced anything meaningful in the realm of political economy which has helped us to drive society forward but in fact that baton thereafter was passed to the great socialist thinkers and it was the socialist thinkers hereafter who have advanced our understanding of econ uh, economy politics uh, and history but this is from uh, uh, adam smith's inquiry into the nature and causes of the wealth in nations and it's important because this paragraph which i'm going to read is not widely recognized and taught as being true, but it's an old observation, which is uh, also the fundamental essence of our understanding of socialist economics and a socialist critique of capitalism. So this is what he wrote. One sort of labor adds to the value of the subject upon which it is bestowed. There is another which has no such effect. The former, as it produces a value, may be called productive, the latter unproductive labor. So there's productive and unproductive labor, but labor, thus the labor of a manufacturer, of a worker, adds generally to the value of the materials which he works upon. So value, wealth of society comes from the work of the manufacturer. That of his own maintenance, so for his own wages and for his master's profit. So the capitalist profit and the worker's wages alike come from the labor of the manufacturers of the working class was an old observation of this. And Adam Smith, you know, is the doyen of capitalism and the understanding of, of capitalism. There's still institutes named after him, which are capitalist and imperialist think tanks. But this is what he said, that the value of goods comes from work, comes from the work of the laborer. And it's the labor through working that creates not only his own wages and the value of those, but also the profits of the capitalist. So the concept that we have, a modern concept which we constantly talk, which is that value uh, is made by the very wealthy, that we must invite the very wealthy into our society, give them conditions to make a lot of money and that will trickle down and help all of uh, 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 the people of our country is a false one. It is work, it is labor. That creates value and that's very important conclusion to note in passing that we're going to return to it so the task of the socialist therefore you know, this was the understanding of so scientific socialism is not the concoction of plans for the reorganization of society not sermons to the capitalists about improving the conditions of the workers not the organization of conspiracies but the organization of class struggle of the proletariat and the leadership of that struggle the final aim of which is the capture of political power by the working class and the organization of a socialist society. And that's very important because up to here, we had, for example, in the early, in, in this period of the industrial revolution, uh, there was a class, there was a, I think one great English uh, idealist socialist uh, called Robert Owen, who himself uh, was a capitalist, but thought about how the lot of the English working class could be improved when he saw them laboring in worse and worse conditions. Uh, and he built uh, an ideal, what he thought was a model industrial settlement in Lanark. It's he called it New Lanark in, in Scotland. And you can still go there. I've been there uh, uh, as, a, as a young man, as a, as a teenager. And it's kind of a, a old uh, industry and technology, but it was built about, you know, designing really houses, housing that was decent for families to live in, of making sure that the hours of the workers were decent and sustainable, of making sure they had enough remuneration to provide uh, a decent wherewithal for life and providing some schooling for children. But it was all done on the basis of, he realized his charity, of his individual will to try and look after his workers. It was a paternalistic society in which it didn't release the true potential of the working class and it didn't solve the fundamental problem of, of capitalist exploitation. It remained the case that he was the ruler, he was the master, his writ went and it didn't change. His individual uh, organization didn't catch on amongst other masters who wanted to wring the maximum profit. So you know, it became increasingly clear to socialists 
that through an understanding of economics that actually the capitalist couldn't do without workers, but workers could do without the capitalist, that it was possible to reorganize society on a different footing. And that therefore had to be their goal, the conquest of political power to reorganize society based on our understanding of ec uh, economics. And that became the basis of a socialist political economy. You know, um, we are encouraged to believe that classes are a thing of the past, they don't really exist, that if we strive, we can succeed, um, that there's a meritocracy in modern life. Uh, Margaret Thatcher famously had a dogma that there was no such thing even of society. You know, there was only the individual and their family and business is the engine and motive force of production. But I would like to, you know, draw to the forefront, which is probably very obvious, you know, I'm kind of very obvious to most of our viewers, but it's not, not widely recognized in society that we live in a deeply class ridden society. And those classes in our modern society are the capitalist class and the proletariat, the working class, and their interests are diametrically opposed. So these three people that you see there, that's Jeff Bezos, Bill Gates and Warren Buffett and just off screen, you can see there's a Facebook millionaire there of some kind, but forget him. Those three billionaires in the United States together have more wealth, more capital, more influence, more power than the poorest 200 million Americans. So it's a, they have a fundamentally different role in production. They have a fundamentally different grip on power. Um, and this is a, the overwhelming fact of modern society that can't be ignored. And if you look at the distribution of wealth, you can see that the poorest 60% have a tiny fraction of the wealth. And in fact, the richest 1% have over 40% of the entire wealth of the United States. And this is reproduced uh, actually across the world. Engels wrote uh, long ago, as long as it got 1844, a work describing the poverty of the working class generated by the modern uh, mode of production that is capitalism. Uh, uh, and, and essentially the ever decreasing standards of life seen at that point uh, in England. And really, I think this is a good summary of the lot of the different classes that holds equally good today as it did then. So the bourgeoisie, the capitalists have all the wealth and all the power in its hands. It has the plants, the factories, the mines, the land, the banks, the railways, the bourgeoisie is the ruling class and the proletariat, the working class has all the oppression and the poverty so concentrated at two poles. And you know, the extent to which that remains the case, the extent to which actually it's worse than ever in terms of the concentration of riches in one pole in an ever dwindling number of hands and poverty at the other, for the vast mass of the world's population is encapsulated even by Oxfam's posters. You know, Oxfam pointed out this poster a year ago. So there's constantly increasing concentration of wealth in fewer and fewer hands. And just eight billionaires now own the same wealth as the poorest half of the planet. And to imagine that they are equal, that they have the same rights, political rights, the same life ex expectancy and chances is well that is true utopian <laughs> that is a truly I mean, it's it's a it's a fantasy to believe that that could possibly be the case the gulf between the two classes grows ever wider and deeper the contradictions in our society ever deeper and so too does the indignation of the working masses i think there are many parallels to the current crisis that we're going through um you know, the economic crash associated with the coronavirus but not caused by the coronavirus uh, and the classic Wall Street crash of the 1930s, a huge increase in the impoverishment of the masses, le leading to a reduction in our purchasing power and relatively a glut of unsaleable goods that the workers are unable to buy, meaning that therefore production doesn't become profitable. There are more layoffs and closures and further impoverishment of the masses. And this is something that's been going on for the last year pre preceding the coronavirus, but uh, 
absolutely exacerbated and brought to the fore by it. And we're living in a world where still millions of people are going hungry, so a handful of parasites can live in luxury and idleness. And it's class consciousness, it's an increasing awareness that this system doesn't serve humanity and must go, that we need to foster. We don't need to indulge in begging and sermons. The capitalist class are well aware. In fact, they're more aware. There's currently um, an organization of progressive billionaires, would you believe it? Billionaires who are demanding of governments that they actually do away with the doctrine of entirely laissez-faire free market fundamentalists. And they're demanding to be taxed more to try and alleviate this massive poverty they see because they themselves see that their entire show is so close is teetering uh, on the edge of the real deep instabilities and contradictions within society. And they really fear uh, a revolutionary situation. They fear it more perhaps than many sections of the working class realize uh, is that uh, within their ability to change, to grasp the nettle and to change society. But what are classes? What is meant by classes in general? Well, I think the answer to that is it's what allows one part of society to take the labor, to take the wealth, as Adam Smith himself pointed out, of another. How does one class live off another? Well, it's through the arrangement of society around production, about the way in which we produce all the wherewithal we need, our means of subsistence, basically, our food, our clothes, our shelter, how we produce that in a modern way. Production, labor is social, it's a social process. And that's the power of production has been laid bare through cooperation in labor. And there's an example there of a modern factory, but you can think of any workplace setting. I work in a hospital. A hospital is a, is a social means of production. There's no way that I can perform a single operation without a scrub nurse, without perhaps an assistant, without an anesthetist, without people who maintain the theater, without someone who brings in the necessary anesthetic guesses, without oxygen being regularly supplied to the hospital and piped, without electricity, without uh, the appropriate um, diagnostic facilities, without my colleagues who help me to look at x-rays and measure x-rays, without, so, you know, without people who are able to rehabilitate and care for the patients afterwards. So, you know, the idea that one person sits as some kind of, um, individual star and makes these wonderful health outcomes is as much of a fantasy as the idea that one person could build a modern day car or a truck the whole of the social pro, uh, pro the whole of the production process the whole of um harnessing the power that was found slumbering in the lap of social labor it's a social process but because labor is a social process in the way we produce it doesn't mean that production is always arranged in the same way. And it's that way in which production is organized, which gives rise to different classes. Means of production and labor power are the essential elements of production that but they can be arranged in different ways and in different historical epochs have been arranged in different ways in order to produce. So if one part of society appropriates all the land and land is the principal means of production, the way of producing food and goods, the way of producing the necessary materials to spin cloth, then we have the classes of lords who own the land and peasants who work upon the land. An entire few epoch was based upon that division of labor. And you see that those two groups had different relationship to the means of production to the land. One owned, one worked. If one part of society owns the plants, the factories, shares, capital, while the other part works for them, we have the classes of capitalists and proletarians. And this increasingly we are the main two classes into which the whole of the world is broken down, though there are obviously subdivision and strata of those classes, intermediate classes, like the small owners who themselves feel crushed by the competition. Imagine the small bookkeeper compared to Amazon. Imagine the small shop owner compared to Tesco and Tesco, you know, uh, local stores, mobile stores. Um, very difficult to compete only by working themselves more and more. Imagine the taxi driver compared to the large conglomerate uh, uh, cabs, the individual owner of his cab. So constantly having to work themselves harder and harder to try and keep up for lower and lower returns. So these petty bourgeois classes are increasingly broken and forced into the real ranks of the working class. They themselves become smaller classes and are definitely allies in our quest to build a more just and equitable society where they have a lasting and sustainable future. 
So we'll read this. Classes are large groups of persons differing according to their places in the historically established system of social production, according to their relations to the means of production, according to their roles in the social organization of labor, and consequently, according to their methods obtaining and the size of the share of social wealth of which they dispose. Classes are groups of persons of which one group is able to appropriate the labor of another, owing to a difference in their respective position. Now, in the 1920s and the 30s, while the last massive crisis, you know, almost 90, year, 90 years ago now, hit, while there was a dust bowl in the United States, while there was mass unemployment, while there was 50 million unemployed in the United States, and more and more millions employed all over the world. Interestingly, figures which are currently being outstripped when we look at the United States as we see it now. They have higher num rates of unemployment than they did at that time, but probably not quite the levels of classic poverty due to the position that they've earned by exploiting the rest of the world. But that's something, again, that we're going to return to. Um, they looked increasingly to the socialist societies, to the countries where workers had in fact seized the means of production and through their own labor were building hydroelectric power stations, were conjuring up modern industry, were themselves becoming their own rulers. And increasingly that movement spread. We don't have at the moment the same moral impetus and force, the same clearly painted picture for workers to look to and turn to. And it's that that we increasingly need to establish because the ideologists of the capitalist class, the modern economists, the professors of economy no longer really investigate the laws of production. They no longer look to the ways in which we can solve the problems of capitalism, but they in fact seek to preserve the capitalist class. They become increasingly the lackeys and the servants, the Francis Fukuyamas, the Milton Friedmans of this world, simply try to extol the virtues of capitalism. They seek to destroy the faith of the workers that they can build, that we can build a socialist society, a socialist economy that serves the interests of working people. And so famously, Francis Fukuyama wrote a book which literally was called The End of History, with the collapse of, um, with, the, with the fall of the Berlin Wall and the collapse of the Soviet Union. And this is what he said, what we may be witnessing is not the end of the Cold War, because the Cold War, let's not forget, became the struggle between workers and capitalists on an international basis, when workers in some countries had actually overthrown their capitalist oppressors and were building a socialist society. And the class struggle that we see within our society constantly churning, constantly causing chaos, constantly causing strife, became reflected on the international scene. And that really was the meaning of the so-called Cold War. It was not a shooting war because the imperialists didn't invade the socialist countries, but they constantly sought to destroy them by every means at their disposal. So they said, what we're witnessing is not the end of the Cold War, but the end of history as such. That is the end point of man's ideological evolution and the universalization of Western liberal democracy in you know, a code, therefore, for capitalism. Capitalism is the end of history. This form of exploitation of man by man is the end product, is the highest point. This was their dogma that they put forward. Interestingly, they're climbing down a little bit. But ask yourself, this was the hunger map of 2019, 821 million people, okay, more than one in nine. Actually, it's more than that. It's probably over a billion people don't get enough to eat. How sustainable is that system? How can we call this the end of history? How can we assert that this is the highest form of humanity? So political economy, the study of political economy lays bare the laws of economic motion of modern society. Capitalist relations arose on the ruins of the previous system, on the ruins of the feudal system, developed and pushed it forward. But the contradictions within the system, its constant impoverishment of the masses, its constant limitation of its own development, it's constantly having to destroy its own means of production. You know, why can't we, on the one hand, use our ability to produce almost limitlessly to satisfy the needs of this mass of people who are hungry, impoverished, uh, suffering famine, suffering disease. Why can't we solve the problems? Why do we spend 850 billion on arms, but we can't solve the problems of hunger, which would take a fraction of that cost to solve? Capitalism cannot solve those problems. 
as long as the means of production remain in the hands of a tiny number of people who monopolize the wealth themselves. So that those contradictions that arise within the system give rise to their own decay and capitalism above all creates its own grave diggers. It creates a mass of modern workers who cannot tolerate any longer this bizarre and perverse, you know, chaos. It's like that rhyme of the ancient mariner, water, water everywhere, but not a drop to drink. There's wealth coming out of our ears in this country. There's wealth coming out of the ears of the city of London based upon the exploitation of man by man, of nation by nation, of the world by Britain. We had an empire in which the world never set for 300 years. There's so much money that actually is more profitable for our capitalists to invest it abroad and put our own working people to work. But this creates a system which is simply untenable, where life becomes impossible, and we say there must be a way forward. One billion are hungry, one billion are not clothed, one billion have no access to clean water, half the population of the planet have less than the richest eight billionaires. War, hunger, environmental destruction are the hallmarks of modern capitalist society in its last phase. And all this have been increasingly laid bare by the 2020 crisis. We're going to return to some of these themes. I really wanted to just whet your appetite as to what it is that is political economy, and particularly because there are so many schisms, there are so many divisions within the working class movement. It's very important that we all return back to the essence of what we're talking about. Why is it that Tony Blair can call himself a socialist? when he wages war, when he serves the city, when he preserves capitalism, when he serves the interests of the wealthy and fights the interests of the working class, yet he is the leader of the apparently a socialist party. We must return to the basics of what political economy is. Because workers above all, if we're going to organize the class struggle, if we're going to use political economy as a tool to understand our oppression and also to liberate ourselves and bring forward a new kind of economy, We've got to make that the basis of our appeal to the working people of Britain and the world. And we need a party that was capable of organizing workers to win socialism. And that is the project that we are all involved in. And to all our listeners who are not yet involved in it, or have been watching and wondering and waiting from the sidelines, should they get involved? I want to encourage you most strongly. And George, we've got a militant fighter for the working class with a strong media footprint and an appeal that's able to reach masses of people and we have an increasingly large group of vibrant workers in Britain who understand the essence of the society both that we're fighting and the society we want to bring about and over the next couple of weeks whilst George is having a well-earned uh, family time with Gyatri and we wish them all the best for the birth of a new baby we're going to return to some of these themes so today I've really talked about what is the scope of political economy no more than that really just to whet your appetite and introduce the subject. But we're going to return to this theme, I hope, and we're going to talk about how society became capitalist. We're going to talk about commodity production and its essence and, the, and what is the essence, really, of capitalist exploitation. I'm going to stop sharing that with you. I don't know if you've seen me or just the slides. If it's just the slides and it's been super boring, I'm sorry about that. But I wanted to give you a little bit more. I hope it wasn't too distracting to introduce the theme. So we're discussing political economy, the essence of capitalism, and really on the basis of that, on the basis of a scientific understanding of the capitalist system, we have to set ourselves the task of bringing a new system into being that serves the interests of working people of this country and the world, but it must be based on our understanding of economics, production, and politics in that light. Thanks, Rob. Sorry if I went on too long. Thanks very much, Ranjit. That was excellent. Yeah, very interesting. Um, Got a few questions and hands up here, so I'm going to go straight to Andrew if you're able to uh, unmute yourself. Thanks very much. Hope everybody could hear me. Um, yeah. Thank you. I'd just like to thank Dr. Bra first of all for his uh, his presentation, uh, which I thought was very interesting and very informative. Um, I've got a question for Dr. Bra and the panelists. Really, one of the of the means that Dr. Bra mentioned that capitalists have in their armory, if you like, is the banks. And one of my interests, though I'm not, a, not an economist, is in the field of monetary reform. Um, and I'd just like 
to ask Dr. Bra and the panelists how to what extent does he and they think that a reform of the monetary system along the lines of the organization in the UK, uh, a positive money, who um, advocate for a sovereign money system that takes away uh, the power of um, private banks to create credit and passes it over to a governmental authority uh, that can issue money on behalf of the people. That's obviously a very simplistic explanation. Um, I'd just like to ask to what extent you think that could be a means of unlocking and eradicating at least some of the ills of capitalism and putting the power back in the hands of the workers. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks very much. Uh, Ranjit, would you like to uh, come back on that point there? Um, yeah, okay. Thank, thanks. That was a really interesting question. Thank you. Um, so uh, capital it wasn't clearly understood by a whole early generation of revolutionaries. And it's really interesting that, for example, the Paris Commune in 1871, which is one of the very early times that the working class, the working class of Paris, who constantly rose to revolution, uh, uh, tried to take power. It was on the back of an in invasion of their country and the war, the Franco-Prussian uh, uh, War. Um, but the communards seized power. They seized power only for 70, 71 days uh, in 1870, March 18, March 18th, I think, 1871. Um, and they did several things. They organized themselves as the ruling class. They uh, started to reorganize production and put the, uh, the wealth in their hands. But what they didn't do, and they didn't realize clearly, was the role of banks. They didn't seize the banks. They didn't seal the wealth of, seize the wealth of the banks or the wealth of the bankers. And they left capital in private hands. So it was very interesting and something that drew a lot of comment subsequently. So there's no question that socialists have to seize control of the wealth. Um, what does the wealth really consist of? It's something we're going to be coming back. Where does wealth come from? What does money signify? To what extent is money real to what extent does where, where is the value of money to what extent does money function merely as an exchange equivalent and to what extent is it the embodiment of real value and if there's paper money or computer money does it have real value um so uh, the, these are, are complex questions which i think we should best deal with when we start to have a look at really what is the essence of value, what is the essence of commodity circulation? And we will look at those things, but we'd be getting a little bit ahead of ourselves to talk about you know, uh, modern monetary theory. But unquestionably, if you look at social societies, social societies do have wealth, they have a way, of, but they use you know, money. They use money increasingly as a regulator of production. And they can even at a certain stage substitute money uh, by a, a different thing, which is a, a, essentially a unit of time, a unit of, pr of participation in production. If all wealth comes from labor power, one of the things we have to charge capitalism with is that it, it squanders a huge amount. If you look at the unemployed population who don't work, that is all really squandered wealth as far as humanity is concerned. Not only is it degrading to the individual to be without work, but it's a it's a huge loss of overall wealth to humanity that such a huge number of people are in fact on the scrap heap of unemployment, are marginalized, uh, a huge number of people who still live on the land, um, don't have sufficient land to use their labor productively. So we are wasting land. So really the, the secret to unlocking and getting rid of poverty is not just dis redistribution of what there is, but it's allowing the conditions for us all to work and live in civilized ways. And through our work, we will generate all that workers need um, to live in a very healthy and sustainable way. So I'm gonna I'm gonna leave it there, but I'm gonna leave the question slightly open to our future sessions. And I think it'll it'll fit more naturally into those. Thanks, Ranji. Thanks, Andrew. Um, I'm going to come to Hells next. We've got a question. Thanks, Rob. Hi. Um, it's a it's a miserable situation at the moment, uh, where the, the people in the very lowest quality jobs and lowest paid jobs, um, they're having. I mean, yes, there's workers' rights and things like that. 
um, that the conditions are getting worse and worse that they're having to work in. Um, and like I said, yes, there's workers' rights, but the thing is, when you have no choice and there are very few jobs um, out there and you can't pick and choose and you can't leave and just step into another job, then you're in a situation where you're prepared to keep your head down and accept these um, uh, work, you know, the destruction of workers' rights and the, uh, the falling conditions. You're prepared to just accept them, even if there are employment laws against them and things like that, because, you know, people just want to keep the head down, draw the wedge, not make waves, you know. Um, there's not there's very little you can do as, as singularly as uh, you know as as, as one person uh, and people are so afraid of losing their job or being singled out and things like that I, I do think people need to work collectively um and and more and more so I was going to ask Dr Bra um you know, the, you talked a little bit about a brilliant um, talk, by the way. You talked a bit about um, the 1920s and 30s recession. Do you think that there is another recession on its way? And, and what would that look like uh, in today's society? Thanks, Hells. Thanks very much. Um, Rangji, uh, would you like to uh, provide a response there? Sure. No, thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, that's a really interesting question. So um, uh, unquestionably, unemployment is a massive stick uh, with which to beat the working class. It divides us. We're ground down by that competition for work. Uh, and our condition and, and pay, pay and conditions are constantly getting worse and worse, um, increasing you know, pro driving people down to the minimum standards. I mean, you saw recently that if there was um, a re-imposition of lockdown in Leicester, that where did the coronavirus cases come from? They came from actually sweatshops. And it wasn't like a, a hidden um, fact. It was like well known. Everyone realized capitalists are, are fully cognizant of the fact that they can employ people on half a minimum wage in Leicester, basically essentially in third world conditions within Britain. Um, not that British are inherently superior and we shouldn't be treated that way, but no one should be treated in that way. It's an open secret that the level of unemployment is such that actually people can be employed on virtually slave wages. Uh, and it's interesting to talk about what is exploitation because these wages we're told are exploitation. We're going to return to the fact that under capitalism, in fact, all employment relations are the very wages system itself is exploitation, but I don't want to get ahead of myself. But unquestionably, unemployment is a stick to beat the workers. And at times of great unemployment and depression, it's very hard to organize collectively um, because at the end of the day, the threat of starvation is what the capitalist use is to uh, force the workers to return to work. Um, but collective bargaining within unions, collective organization within political parties, which aim not only to, as trade unions, can retard that downward trend, that downward pressure of the capitalists upon all of us, but actually to fight the capitalists at their own game, to understand the broader question of production, to understand that it's necessary to organize, to, to think about waging a struggle to win political power and building an alternative society, those things are incredibly important and can only, as you say, be done in cooperation. The working class is characterized by feeling its strength uh, as a group, as a whole. And that is an important part of our sporting culture. It's an important part of you know, our culture and the way that we have come to really uh, survive collectively through trade union struggle. And it's a tradition that we need to revive and we need to be part of that uh, when we're building the workers' party. Um, are we facing a great depression? Well, it's unquestionably clear that the levels of unemployment, the increasing levels of poverty are absolutely akin to a great depression. And that is not just in this country, but the world over. Um, you know, you can constantly see political commentators like Peter Hitchens saying that this madness to um, protect the public health, 
because it means shutting down the economy and the effects of shutting down the economy are terrible, like it's an either or. But the fact is, take coronavirus away entirely, and that crisis was coming anyway. But coronavirus has unquestionably um, exacerbated and made it much more acute mm. because it causes the markets to realize the underlying weakness um, that there was in terms of demand. And, and you know, always the capitalists, they, they can't rationally plan production. Everything is through the market. So it seems, you know, despite the fact that corporations grow bigger and bigger, have a bigger and bigger market share, they still can't rationally plan production because through impoverishing the workers, they create a, they create the crisis where the workers can't be fed despite there's food. <laughs> they can't be clothed despite the fact that there's clothing. They can't be housed despite the fact they're housing because they become so poor, they can't buy it. And under capitalism, if they've got no money, they exercise no demand, you know, so that they can just starve and the capitalist is powerless actually to help them except through charity and charity is also always an insignificant uh, fraction uh, of the wealth of society. So yes, I'm, I'm afraid to say we are living through economic period where, which is probably greater and worse uh, in terms of its level of inequality, in terms of the generalization of those uh, contradictions within capitalism and in terms of just the sheer numbers. I mean, they're more unemployed than they were in the Great Depression. If you look at the uh, unemployment in, in America is in excess of 52, 53 million and each week another million or so are being added on at the moment. Uh, if you look at the figures in Britain already before this, we had a, we had a figure that was um, that said the inactive, economically inactive population, which is not the figure they give as uh, unemployed, but was already a quarter of the population, quarter of the working age population and not working. And they haven't quite, you know, you, you that they don't quite release the figures that's hidden by furlough it's hidden by just how many people are added to the jobless total but they're predicting that there'll be eight million now when a quarter of the population were actually not active they said that the unemployment figures were at an all-time low at kind of half a million so if they're coming up going to come to eight million you can see that actually we're going to be getting onto perhaps as much as half you know, getting towards half the working pop age population who are not in work and it's a it's a tremendous indictment of any economic system which has got such modern means of production at, at its disposal that has the ability from one man's, you know, or woman's labor to produce enough to feed many, provided all the productions, you know, relations are put together so that we cooperate and unleash that power of our production. There's no reason that a single person should be starving in the world today. So we are facing a crisis, a crisis that capitalism can't solve, but it will carry on. It will carry on it will find a way to survive in the absence of us forcing its hand of taking political power, building a movement and forcing the working people's agenda to the front. So that really has to be the goal that we set ourselves. Else. Okay. Thanks, Ranjit. Thanks very much. Um, <clears throat> I've got a couple of uh, points that people have made in the chat here. I'll just uh, read out this one from Stephen. He's pointed out that the majority of money is digital and only 3% isn't. This pandemic is moving us more to contactless and digital currencies. So I think, uh, you know, Stephen is obviously positing there, you know, what is, is this something that's, uh, you know, marks a, a massive departure from the way that you know, we're used to things working. Uh, what what's its what's the effect of that going to be for, for for working people? Obviously, we do understand that. You know, in times of economic uh, you know crisis, uh, the the money, the physical money in your pocket can be devalued to the to the point that it's uh, almost worthless. Um, but I understand that you know this uh, issue of contactists and uh, you know non physical kind of. Uh, money transfers is, is is something that people have concerns about. Have you got any uh, you know thoughts about that, Ranjit? Yeah, I always like George's response to this when he says he doesn't care or it's not interesting <laughs> on the show. But the but the bottom line is, I mean, paper money already is divorced from gold gold money. Gold money is the actual commodity. When we talk about commodities and what gives the value, gold is a real thing. There's labor power embodied in it, so there's real value in it. So when you exchange things of real value, it's like a trade. By the time you have just a token of that, the, always the idea with the gold standard was that that token was meant to be linked to a real amount of value and you could, could present your little chit to a bank somewhere and they would dig up a little bit of gold and give it to you. So it was really worth something. But it was really, 
we've moved beyond that. The long ago they've got rid of the gold standards. What really gives the value of currencies is the underlying economic health and productivity of the nation who issues that currency. Um, and increasingly, yeah, the banks are, are involved in all kinds of speculation in futures and essentially gambling with this huge, vast amounts of wealth because they don't have productive ways to engage it. But if we are given you know, paper units or the money goes direct to your bank, it's still, as far as you're concerned, as an individual worker, a token for us, it functions simply as exchange. We're given some tokens for which we can exchange for a certain amount of products. That amount of products basically leads to what we consider our standard of life. And depending on your skill of labor, you're getting more and more or, le more or less. It's very rare that you can you know, work your way up from that point to having enough money, enough of these tokens that it can function as capital, that you can start to employ workers, that you can start to make money out of it, that you can break from being a, a worker into a capitalist. And really, you know, the capitalist institutions, the banks, that the, oh, there are so few and they've got such huge amounts of capital, they've monopolized the economy, they decide which businesses can, can fail and do poorly. But the actual change from a paper money to a contactless, you know, computer screen has been happening sequentially for a long time. And that in itself doesn't have huge significance to workers. What, what, you know, what it does signify is that wealth, the ability, really, what, what do you need to, to make me work for you? You've got to give me some means of then getting the means of subsistence I need to live. And that's done through, through money and giving me a certain amount. And whether you give me an exchange token, as long as I can genuinely exchange it for those goods, to me, it doesn't make it, I don't see the significance in it that others do, that it becomes purely electronic money. That that um, trick has been played a long time ago with paper money. And this is just a, a you know, this is more, a, a, I don't see it as a fundamental change in the economics of capitalism, Rob. Thanks, Rangji. Um, yeah, it's, it has been pointed out there in the chat, the self-employed are dreading it, no more cash payments. No well, the, that, that just is a slightly different thing, which is the inability to avoid taxes. So the extent to which people are having to get by and have a slightly better life by not paying what is a, what is a tax burden that falls disproportionately hardly on, on the working people. So working people have very little. Uh, anyone under 20,000 who is taxed, you could argue, is it's, a, it's totally unjust. I mean, many people live on entire families. A third of the families in London a few years ago were living on £12,000 a year. It's a paltry amount to raise your whole family on, given the expenses that you're talking about. So to tax people like that, to introduce tax on earnings of 10000 lower, as some governments have tried to recently, is patently ridiculous. And so the workers' instinctive reaction to that is to avoid paying tax. If it's all electronic, they can't do that. Right, so it takes away that means of doing it. So clearly, that there's that implication. That that I think is fair enough. That's a, that's a that is reasonable to point out. If you take away the cash economy, you take away the ability to unilaterally say, "I ain't paying your tax," which is kind of like a individual militant action. But equally, you know, that as wages and paying conditions are eroded, the entire conditions of life of working people are being pressed upon to the point that this individual action of boycott and I up yours <laughs> to the system is is meaningless. It's not going to improve your life in a substantial way. And so what's needed is collective action to, as we've been talking about, to actually change, to put the real wealth creation and the genuine huge amount of wealth that exists in society in the hands at the service of working people as opposed to at the service of banks and capitalists whose sole interest is to constantly enrich themselves at our expense. Bastards. Thanks, Rangji. Um, I will come to uh, Joshua. You there, Joshua? Yes, very much so. Good evening. All right. How's everyone doing? Good, thanks, Josh. Yes. Um, yes, I haven't met you in person before. I have met your sister just uh, on the record. Um, what, what are you trying to say? Oh, I'll <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 just just saying at, uh, at that at that conference in um, in uh, West London, you know, that was uh, you know she was convincing me to ditch the Labour Party, and I did uh, at the time somewhat reluctantly, but I'm so proud I did. I, anyway, enough yeah. about me. Enough about me. Um, basically, a lot of capitalists, when I look at their videos about you know uh, trolling us, the socialists anyone who they consider to be left-wing, 
they use the old rhetorical mantra, okay, that the technology that we use to express our views was in and of itself a product of capitalism. Now, do not get me wrong, I do not agree with that necessarily because the, the person who made this dev electronic device that I'm speaking to you now was actually probably a worker, was not an oligarch. The oligarch does not make the electronic device. They design it. However, they often argue that capitalism is the impetus for uh, technological marvels. Uh, uh, not the internet, actually, because it started off as a government-funded project by America, uh, by the United States, and the inventor of it actually worked for a, sci a, 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 a institute for uh, a scientific research uh, of the World Wide Web. But, however, a lot of household appliances that we take for granted today are a product to an extent of capitalism and I think that we should address that what, what you would call a, a sort of as I say the rhetorical mantra so that we can argue against the the, the concept that capitalism leads to technological innovation because I know that the Soviet Union it invented this the world's first artificial satellite that we is integral to our everyday lives even in weather forecasting for instance uh, socialism invented the the space rocket, the first rocket to go into space, sent the first man into space and has invented some pretty impressive military aircraft. But we do have to acknowledge, uh, well, not acknowledge, but uh, I think we should certainly uh, address that argument that capitalism has led to better household products uh, that we, that ordinary working people take for granted. I, of course, am happy to challenge that, but I need a bit more in my sort of philosophical arsenal than what I've just outlined to you today. Yeah, that was what I had to say. Thanks very much, Joshua. Rangji, what do you say to that? I can say a lot to that. It's kind of the intellectual equivalent that, you know, when I was very young and I, and I liked socialism, uh, and I talked about it in the 1980s with uh, people in Hemel Hempstead. They would say, well, if you like it so much, why don't you go and live in Russia? Or they would say to you, well, if you're a socialist, you shouldn't be wearing a Nike trainer <laughs> or something like that. You know. So the bottom line is, I don't think you can look at history from such a narrow perspective. Mankind has had many different production systems, many different... Uh, uh, inventions at many different times without zero being invented by mathematicians in ancient India, without Archimedes declaring, give me a lever big enough and I'll move the world, without shouting Eureka and working out displacement theory, without Pythagoras discovering maths. None of this would be possible. So it's all because of the ancient Greeks. So you should go back and live in an ancient slave society because that's where we made it. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a silly argument. Um, human, humanity comes up with inventions and actually the function of the capitalist is not to himself create inventions but his f f function at a certain point was simply to make money and he realized he could make money out of harnessing science and technology to a point and certainly capitalism compared to feudalism um, you know no one dreamt that slumbering in the lap of productive labor power was the immense means of production and you know the uh, the founders of scientific socialism sung a veritable panegyric to the productive powers of capitalism because it did symbolize the ability of mankind to liberate himself from slavery and judgery. Cooperation, labor, the ability to produce all the wherewithal of modern production, conjuring whole populations from the ground, building modern cities. This is unquestionably the function of modern industry and technology, yes, which has come about under capitalism. But Capitalism has come to the point where precisely because all of the wealth is concentrated in the hands of a tiny number of people, precisely because the motive force of production is to further increase their wealth, not to satisfy the needs of humanity. Actually, capitalism has become a break on the means of production, a fetter on their use. It stops us from satisfying the needs of the population. So it, it's not a question of who invented what any more than, you know, the racists who said that the TV was invented by Europeans and, you know, by et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's simply, you know, this is just a, a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a stupid way to look at history. Um, and it certainly is an incorrect way to look at economics and technology. We've got to the point where actually capitalists will take inventions and prevent them 
from coming into production until he has satisfied himself that he has made the most he can out of old technology. So there's designed obsolescence, he'll design goods which will break, so he'll have to buy new ones. It doesn't serve humanity. You know, he'll, he'll spend unnecessary amounts of humanity's productive power producing fripperies that we don't need. You know, little bits of plastic that you get for free in your cornflakes packet while huge portions of the world are going hungry. So it's precisely production relations under capitalism that stop technology now from assuming the role it should. We're all promised that there would be labor saving devices. We're all promised a peace dividend when the Soviet Union collapsed. Capitalism cannot deliver for the mass of the people. It constantly impoverishes more and more and more of us. And despite the ability to produce enough to, 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 to have very civilized and cultured lives for literally the whole of humanity, which would transform the, individu the individual existence of all of us, of absolutely all of us, including the, would have better lives collectively than the billionaire who lives on his own island, Necker Island, and imagines he can just escape from global warming and escape from war and escape from environmental degradation. All of those problems can only be solved collectively by applying modern technology to the full. And that means breaking this contradiction between the social nature of production, but the private nature of accumulation. And it's that that socialism is. It's not about one system creating, you know, it's human inventiveness that has created all things and overwhelmingly you'll find the inventors of things are not the ones who profit from them overwhelmingly uh, and you'll find that most scientists technologists people who are inventing are themselves uh, salaried workers who make relatively little money and similarly you know some of the heights of technology has been produced by large uh, state funded investment whether that's in europe whether that's in the united states and it's nasa or whether it's in, within the soviet union and their space program so on many levels i think uh, it's very easy to um get rid of that argument but the thing is that argument is one which is rhetorically put i used to have a, a colleague i worked with who's from canada who would constantly say in an irrelevant way in regard to nothing in particular of course that's a good idea in theory, like communism is a good idea in theory, but we all know it doesn't work in practice. So you know, when people say capitalism invented X, Y, Z, there's normally no one on the media who will challenge those ideas, but they're very easy to challenge. Does that make sense? Thanks, Ranjit. <clears throat> I've already muted Joshua there, so I hope that he has in enjoyed your uh, response there. Um, I'm going to come to Georgie next. Oh, hello. Hi, Georgie. Hi, yeah. Um, just on the subject of money, um, well, really, we've got these NHS workers' protests coming up this weekend, and I've been told by other nurses to stop whinging, and there's not enough money in the pot, and to get on with it, and we started our three-year rubbish um, pay award two years ago and just shut up about it. And I've got another brief thing about e-money. Those people they're on or below the breadline very often they may have a bank account but it may be in deficit and therefore they won't have the money if you see what I mean and I know me personally when I was in that situation I would grab all the cash out as soon as the universal credit went in or whatever it was um, just so I had money available for stuff and then I'd accumulate debt but I was going to go more back to what the nurses were saying to me that there isn't enough money in the pot stop whinging how can I gently persuade them that they're wrong because I don't have a clue what I'm talking about because I don't understand the economics thanks Georgie good to see you um, um, the answer is that, that our country is literally awash with money um, that throughout crisis, uh, the wealthiest get richer and richer, that there are um, perhaps 50 trillion in offshore accounts, which are not essentially taxed, um, that the richest companies, um, the Apples, the Googles, the Microsoft, if you look at their corporate tax, it's well under 1% percent when you really work it out as a fraction of their earnings countries like starbucks who make billions don't pay any tax at all essentially in this country because of the way they display their earnings as the as the um products of or the profits of companies who are registered in the virgin islands and other tax havens so what we have in our country is a system whereby the wealth the really productive industries that still make a lot of money 
in this country and and the banks who make money not only from exploiting the labor of british people but people all over the world um uh have vast sums of money but that's all in private hands and is not taxed in the proportionate way uh, it's to tax in a very fraudulent way they do of course contribute uh, to the national exchequer and they, they live here but our governments have prided themselves on creating a tax haven essentially where they invite billionaires from all over the world who find it convenient to come and invest here buy property live here they can live kind of parallel lives with private schools and private health they don't really walk among us they're kind of near us but they have an entirely parallel world they inhabit um which is not dependent on public funding so all of the private wealth is in a tiny number of hands and what we're talking about is not merely begging not singing them how we deserve better how we're good people what we're talking about is saying that that system is unsustainable and can't work and pharmaceutical industries who make billions why are they private when the nhs which is the spending on the health is public so all debt and our current system is made public and is taxed and the tax burden falls disproportionately upon those who have wages and disproportionately upon those who have low wages though the very wealthy always point to the large amounts they give in tax but as a proportion of their wealth is minuscule and what we're talking about what socialism really means is not a few more pennies for workers and a few more pennies in tax to the capitalist class it means taking the sources of wealth the means of production the things that they actually make all their money from which is as adam smith pointed out you know as the last great capitalist political economist pointed out that comes from the work of working people the labor of the masses and it's the work it's the labor power it's the labor performed by workers that generates not only our own wages but all the profit for the capitalists and what we're talking about is using that wealth um to improve our standard but right now within without having a revolution without changing fundamentally the means of production yes there is money why is it that 330 billion can be found to give to businesses at the time of coronavirus in a second uh, why is it that when there was a crisis in 2009 more than 450 billion was found to bail out the banks which were told it's too big to fail and then we were all squeezed through a decade of austerity with palpably the conditions of the working class in england falling to repay the national debt which had been generated solely by giving this huge amount of private equity or public equity to private sector so the private debt rather than in the 1930s as those who lost their shirts in the wall street crash threw themselves out of their skyscrapers because they'd lost everything they simply raided the state income and a money was given over which over generations we're having to pay back we learned that when slaves were made free and they were only made free well for, for economic reasons i won't get into but they were they were made free who was compensated it was the slave owners not the slaves so the slave owners have become rich through slavery rich through robbing rich through the work of the slaves then when they had to make their slaves free and instantly they carried on exploiting them as low paid workers and sharecroppers in the same environments very often wherever they were they were given a huge amount of money for their benevolent funds and that money was given from where from the taxpayers of working people which we finally st stopped paying off 200 years later and actually as we were celebrating the 200th anniversary of the abolition of slavery it wasn't loudly trumpeted but we were still paying off the last of the reparations we paid to the slave owners so there is money the money is it's about the distribution and we cannot fight shy of that you know when tony blair made his speeches when he came to power when he was coming to prominence when he was going to win his election because of course we get rid of that old hat there's a third way in which workers and capitalists can just negotiate nicely and will everyone will do better together i'm afraid that we can see the result of that third way. The result of that third way is the further and massive systematic impoverishment of the working people and the massive enrichment of the capitalists. And we have to frankly say, if working people are going to have a better life, it's by changing the ownership of the wealth of our society. And it's that that we've got to set our aims. Thanks very much, Ranji. Um, I'm going to come to Frank. Are you there, Frank? Hi. I uh, really enjoyed the talk. Um, and just following on from that point, um, obviously, uh, capitalism and those that hold 
the wealth in the land are not going to give it up freely. And this is one of the key points. So we're, we're essentially in a struggle and a, a struggle which uh, would see significant forces um, outnumbering the proletariat in terms of the control mechanisms of army and state and police. But I think one of the things we need to be is honest that there has to be a radical change um, for us to achieve what we want to achieve. Um, and if we look to other societies and uh, other successful revolutions, uh, they have involved revolution. Uh, and that has involved conflict. And I think one of the things that, you know, while we discuss this, uh, I think it's important that all of us recognize that change is not going to come about without some form of conflict. Now, I'm not for one minute proposing open warfare in the streets of Britain, but we are talking about the substantial conflict situation because the last thing that capital will do and those that hold it is allow anyone to challenge. And of course, to date, they do that through what's called the democratic process, through the manipulation of the media through feeding the masses, uh, Big Brother, uh, materialism and all of that rubbish. But I'd be interested, uh, Dr. Bra, on your thoughts on conflict as a mechanism that unlocks the uh, system. Thanks, I think that's a brilliant and very eloquently put point. Um, everyone's been so respectful. My my name's Ranjit. So you can call me you can call me Ranjit. You don't have to call me Doctor Ra. But uh, but thanks, Frank. Um, uh, the, the bottom line is, you know, I think it's grossly disingenuous to suggest that the current order of society is peaceful. Um, not only have we seen in the last century two world wars. The first world war, forty million workers were asked to sacrifice their lives and sacrifice their lives for what? In a great conflict between the biggest robber barons of capitalism who were deciding amongst themselves who was gonna enslave the most slaves, rob the most colonies, hold the most markets. They were quite prepared to kill 40 million. And we all mark very solemnly. Now we really remember the working people who sacrificed themselves in that struggle. But how did that struggle end? It ended through one of the chief participants. So four empires fell, first of all. So the Austro-Hungarian Empire fell, the Tsarist Empire fell, the Habsburg Empire fell, and the, and the Ottoman Empire fell. All those great empires which, which had led to that situation ended with that conflict, but at great cost to the working people. And of course, the Tsarist Empire didn't just fall, it fell because workers had said, no more, we're not going to sacrifice ourselves in our millions to propel this bloody czar, and then later on this capitalist who took their place, and for them to be able to what? Seize Constantinople, seize more territories, seize a part of the Middle East, increase the number of slaves they had. So these bloody conflagrations, after the First World War, of course, there was a period of relative peace. The socialist part of the world grew and started to reconstruct, was encircled by capitalist powers. And those capitalist powers continued to fight amongst themselves in difficult circumstances, went through the Great Depression, throughout through the Great Depression, found their only way out was mobilizing their economy towards war, the rise of fascism. And again, we were flown into a massive conflagration of world war in which this time 60 million died. And of course, 27 million of those were the heroic fighters of the Red Army in the Soviet Union defending themselves from fascism. So the whole concept that capitalism is peaceful. Since the Second World War, we're told we've had peace at the time of the EU. And we're told it was Gordon Brown made these very solemn speeches. We must never leave the European Union. The European Union has been the guarantor of peace since the Second World War. There's not been a single day's peace since the Second World War. I found myself almost screaming and frothing at the mouth when I was listening to him re recite this nonsense as to why we should stay in this imperialist bloc, the, the European Union. But the big capitalists of the earth, you know, it's not natural that wealth flows up there. It's not natural that eight people should have the same amount of wealth as half the planet's population. There's a constant striving for redistribution, for using the national resources of each country to better the lives of the working people of those countries. And it's not always through a socialist system, it's often through a nationalist who comes to power or a progressive who comes to power and just simply doesn't want to be a vassal of imperialism. And the consequence for that, generally, 
uh, after a bit of subversion of your democracy, after someone's interfered in your elections, if they've not managed to displace you in that way, is the next step, which is an escalation to diplomatic war, to sanctions, to isolation. And if that doesn't work, then you know there's outright invasion. And that's been the pattern that we've seen again and again and again from you know, Vietnam, from Korea, from more recently Le Lebanon, Syria, uh, Palestine, Iraq, Afghanistan, Sierra Leone, you know, Ivory Coast. You can go on and on, Libya, you can go on and on and on thinking about the times in which, you know, our big capitalist powers and the conglomeration of big capitalist powers have used the states of the major nations and the armies of the major nations to fight wars which are exclusively about maintaining a system of exploitation. So, you know, uh, uh, these ec economists, these free market fundamentalists say very openly, you know, that the free hand of the market, you know, is sustained by the US military. That's why the US spends 850 billion annually more than the rest of the world combined on military weapons. That's why it has a thousand military bases worldwide. That's why it's in occupation of the world. So, you know, if you look at the United States police force and the fact that we've learned recently that the, you know, the New York police spends more on weapons and armory than the whole of the allegedly very brutal and dictatorial North Korea, you can see the lies, the militaristic nature of our society the constant war with the people, and of course the impoverishment. You know, people talk about the black book of communism. People talk about socialism being a terrible system because they're paid to put those positions forward. But the reality is that every year, probably 40 million people die of malnutrition, malnutrition related diseases in the world. It dwarfs the deaths for coronavirus. I'm happy to talk about coronavirus with people. Uh, it's a subject on, on the lips of everyone, but the real pandemic stalking the earth is poverty. It causes real deaths of millions of people. It causes real equality. And it's never on the news. It should be the top item on the news every day. If on the day that the Manchester bombing happened, deplorable as it was, you know, less than 10 people died. Is that right? Maybe 20, less than 20 people died. From poverty on that day, you'll find that tens of thousands of people will have died on that same day. They die in their mother's arms. They die quietly. But our entire system is a violent and bloody system. So while I'm not advocating, and there's no reason that the transition to a more just and equitable society has to be bloody, apart from the fact that, you know, you can see from the nature of our ruling classes just how bloody, just how determined they are to, to defend their ill-gotten gains. But if we do our job well, if we really win the working class to our side, if we win the masses to our side, to the extent that the social prop of the exploiting classes, and you know, if there are eight people who control this much of the world's resources, it's really in the interest of virtually everyone to change the way we organize society and to change ownership and to ch change economics. And if we do our job well, if we really isolate them from the social prop, because the workers you know, control everything, they run everything. If they come to our side, we will win and we'll win. to the extent we do our job well, we'll win easily. And we have to make our ideas go everywhere. If they spend ages convincing us that capitalism is the end of history, that socialism is the ultra, ultimate evil to befall any society, they do it to sap our strength and to sap the will of the workers to build a different society. We have to get our ideas out into society and to the extent that we will win people to us, the police are workers in uniform, the, the army are workers in uniform. None of them have as their interest the perpetuation of the system. They're given a slightly better wage and told that that's a good job for them when there are no jobs. But if they understand that actually they're fighting against their own interests and at times of crisis they can understand that and history has shown that to the extent that we really win them all to our side, to that extent, we will have to use the minimum force necessary. We want peace. We've got to recognize that we're living in a world of war and to change it is the most peaceful course that humanity can take. Thank you, Ranjit. That was excellent. Um, we're coming towards the end of the evening, but I think I've just got time to uh, ask Claire to make a contribution. You had something to say there, Claire. Hello. Hi. Hi. Ranjit, thank you very much. That, that was really, I, I don't think I can follow that. I mean, but I'm going to try. Um, point seven on the 10 point plan is that workers are able to live full, dignified and meaningful lives. Um, what's the point of having enough, 
having a decent wage, having maybe even reasonable job security, even if we attain that, if we know that beyond our shores people are starving, that we're bombing nations into oblivion. Um, I don't think it's a few who that, for whom that's uncomfortable, that reality. I think the majority of people are very uncomfortable with that. I think the majority of people are deeply disturbed by what we're doing and how we're exploiting the environment and how now we're having to pay. God knows what the price of that's going to be. So I don't care who's developing the technology. What I care about is how is it used? Who, who does it benefit? And we've got to include in that, the, now we've got to include in that the environment. We can't go backwards and go into some sort of Cold War struggle. It's where do we go from here? So for me, socialism is about being, is, is a moral life, a meaningful life. I don't want to live as we see in a gated community, because that's where you go to, isn't it? South Africa, America, as you've talked about, the, the people in London who don't really, really integrate with, with, with the rest of us. Um, that's no way to live. And the planet's telling us that. The planet's telling us that you can't do this anymore. Um, so it's, it's, it's that that I find really exciting about the Workers' Party that it's so simple, um, it seems to me eminently achievable, but it also allows meaning because once you've got those basic needs of food and shelter met, what the hell are we here for? We're here to make it better for everyone else. Otherwise it doesn't mean anything, you know? Thank you. Claire, yeah, thank you so much. I think that was an incredibly powerful point. You know, mankind doesn't live on bread alone. But of course, to the extent to which we live in incredibly unequal societies, as you say, we build, we build prisons for ourselves. The rich build gilded prisons for themselves. And how can you live well when your neighbours are starving? I take my children to school. They go to a comprehensive school in inner city London. I know for a fact, like, you don't see it, but I know for a fact that probably one quarter of the children who attend school with my kids basically are food insecure. You know, what kind of, we said that going into this crisis, there were, when the UN Special Rapporteur for uh, Extreme Poverty and Human Rights came to Britain just two years ago, they said there were uh, a million and a half people who were destitute. And I saw in the paper a couple of days ago that that figure had risen 250%. So that means they're getting on for 4 million people in Britain in the fifth, sixth richest country on earth who are destitute, meaning they don't really know where their food, where their clothing, where their shelter is coming from. And what kind of indictment is that to modern society? I, 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 perhaps there's one more short point I'll make, which is not to, un, I don't want to, I'm not trying to upstage you. I think your point was beautiful and powerful. I hope we can produce it and, and, and um, as a separate point, uh, spread that wider, because I think you made it beautifully. But I'm someone, I'm a, I'm a surgeon and I'm someone who was a socialist before I was a surgeon, but I was inspired perhaps to go into medicine by someone I don't know if you know about called Dr. Norman Bethune. He was a Canadian. He was a Canadian who was practicing surgery at the time of the Great Depression uh, in Canada, uh, who saw around him poverty, who was practicing when there was no national health service, who wanted to help workers, but it was forced to work in a private system where he looked after himself. And at a certain point, he found that he was giving out health care for free to those who couldn't afford it. And they would come and give him whatever goods and services they could. They'd leave him some eggs. They'd leave him some bread. He became closer and closer to the working people of Quebec in Montreal, in Canada. He was drawn into their meeting halls. And he describes a process where he became almost ideologically indoctrinated by their socialist and communist ideals of the time. He said that they, in their meeting halls, though they were poor people, they waved um, a, a rich tapestry of lofty and noble aims and dreams, that they had a high morality and high dreams for the future. And he said it was a heady, a heady mixture. They gave him a new title. He said, uh, I'm a fellow of the Royal College of Surgeons, um, an honorary doctor of philosophy, and now they've given me a new title. They call me Comrade Beth. And he said it was an honorable title and it was nothing for him that was higher. He went on to fight uh, in Republican Spain uh, against the Franco regime. Uh, 
in the international brigades. He went on to fight in the Chinese civil war against the Japanese invaders, and he gave his life there on the battlefield. And he was one of the founders, actually, of the Chinese medical system and one of their early pioneers who was remembered very fondly by them. So his, his, his example is really lofty and noble. But the, the point for that little aside is really to say that there is and should be a moral life and moral force that we bring as we build our movement. It shouldn't be that the church is looked to as the spiritual guider of society. We in our social society have to provide a model of living well, of living communally, of saying that lab labor is noble, labor is lofty, it's the provider of all things that we demand the white to work. We don't want idleness, we don't want handouts, but equally, we don't want exploitation. And it's through understanding, and that's really why I think this is so important to study this politics, this political economy, and understanding of economics, and realizing that our demands are not just pie in the sky, but they're absolutely noble, they're absolutely just, they're absolutely moral, and actually they're the only basis of a rational future and even a, a continuing existence for human society. So thank you so much for sharing that beautiful point, Claire. Thank you very much, Ranji and Claire. Um, we're about to finish up now, we've reached half nine, but I'd just like to say a few words. There is uh, demonstrations happening all over the country this Saturday, the 8th of August. Um, this is NHS Pay 15. Um, the Workers' Party is supporting this campaign and these demonstrations. There are, to date, uh, I think there's 35 total events planned from uh, Truro right the way to Inverness. So in towns and cities across the country, there are NHS workers organising these demonstrations and protests. Uh, they might take different forms depending on whether there is uh, particular um, COVID restrictions. Say, for instance, in Manchester, I know that they've got a particular sort of setup. Uh, but I think that the approach for this, with people being safe, uh, wearing masks, and obviously keeping uh, distanced, um, we want as many people as possible to get out and support this campaign in any way that they can. Um, if Anyone who is watching, you can go to the Workers' Party of Britain website. Uh, you've got some information there um, about what we are saying about this campaign and why we support it. And also there is a link to the Keep Our NHS public website, which has got a full list of where all the uh, demonstrations are planned. So that's this coming Saturday. I think it begins from 11 a.m. Um, I'm just going to ask Georgie to unmute and confirm that for me is that right yes, George? Um, most of them are although i do have it on good authority the cambridge one might be nearer to half 11 because apparently it's quite hard to get there a14 and all the rest of it but yeah 11 o'clock and i understand most of them are going to be silent and then have the speakers at the end but i'm not sure if that's the case for all of them thank you very much georgie yeah thank so you. anyone who's here uh in the meeting today in the uh, participants, uh, go to the party website. There are leaflets that you can download and have printed to, to take to the uh, demonstrations, um, but also to anyone that's watching online. Uh, if you are able to support this, uh, we, we'd really like you to and get on and uh, look out for our workers' party members um, out and about in these demonstrations and uh, come and say hello if you see us. So. Um, I hope that everyone can uh, support that in, in all the ways that we possibly can. So I'm going to say thanks very much to everyone tonight. Uh, Rangjeet, um, if you'd like to say goodbye and I will uh, close the meeting down. Uh, sorry that we didn't get to everyone who had uh, questions um, this evening, but of course, to all the members here, we've got our regular Wednesday night members meeting will be going on tomorrow. And, you know, there's plenty more points that have been raised in the chat uh, and ideas and things that people have got to say so we can continue on there tomorrow. Um, but yeah, for, the, for this evening, thanks very much. Uh, thank you, Ranji. Uh, thanks so much, Rob. Yeah, just say thanks to everyone for your participation and contributions. To all those people who are watching online, I still want to appeal to you all to get involved in this party. We're growing, we're strong, we're becoming a vibrant force in this country and we'll continue to grow, get involved now and help us build. Um, I hope this lecture it really was really just a, an introduction and a, and a touching upon the questions of 
class society and economics. And we're going to come back and visit uh, a few more aspects of those to help to deepen our understanding of what it is that we're fighting for and demanding to help us see all of our demands concretely and put them in perspective. So I hope you'll come back and join us for the next few weeks. And very soon, George will be back with us and we'll be back to our normal uh, full force uh, viewing. George Gatry, wish you all the very best. We're looking forward to hearing news of the new baby. And we'll see you all soon. See you all soon, comrades. Thanks, Rangji.